grid that they have uh, for the community that they're being installed in. So microgrids are shaped to the specific needs of the community. And uh, as said at the and with the opening remarks, there hasn't been a, a more uh, relevant time for these types of solutions uh, than what we're seeing within Europe today. So this is a 30,000 foot view of an energy security framework that uh, shows that and defines the capabilities that can be provided from the community and then the resilient solutions uh, that are required from within. Next slide. So this is not news, hopefully to anybody in the room uh, or online, but there is an energy crisis going on in Europe today. Uh, the, the major headlines change on almost a daily basis. Uh, but the reality is that Europe has an overdependence over the past 10 to 20 years on cheap Russian gas, and that has caused, with the war in Ukraine, uh, a, a rapid pivot away from Russian energy uh, toward energy dependence. So there are, are numerous solutions at a, at a regional and geographic level that the European Union uh, and the uh, International uh, Energy Agency are moving toward. They're trying to diversify LNG supply, uh, expedite renewable energy and energy storage, uh, expedite and uh, promote energy efficiency measures. Um, so again, there are a number of different plans that the region and the European Union are moving toward. Uh, the most recent is that the EU member states have voluntarily agreed to a 15% reduction in gas consumption uh, from now until the end of March. And so rationing is in place. Uh, it's to be determined how and to what extent there may be exceptions for uh, the military or defense or other emergency services. Uh, but this is evolving on, a, as, as said, a daily basis. Some of the solutions here, diversification of energy supply, energy savings and energy efficiency, uh, and accelerated ro rollout of renewables. It's critical that the European Union increases their energy storage uh, to try to hit that target of 80% uh, before winter happens. And so the plan is uh, called here, save gas for a safe winter. So anything today that we can do to lower energy demand uh, for electricity and for gas consumption, that's gonna make for a, a much uh, more secure winter. And as you can see, the, the states are going to have tough decisions here. Uh, they're going to have to prioritize homes and emergency services over industry. So these are the difficult decisions that are uh, being anticipated uh, in the next in the coming months. Next slide. So here, this illustrates the U.S. military's reliance on Russian gas. And much of this comes from the uh, not a, a purchase or power purchase agreement directly with Gazprom or with Russia, but the, the electrons that you're uh, powering your bases by and the, the heat that you're using uh, is, if you follow the supply chain, largely coming from Russia. So there was a study done by Brown University that estimated 30% uh, of the US military's total energy consumption in Europe uh, originated in Russia. Uh, so again, going back to the community framework for energy security, uh, this shows that you as a consumer of energy in Europe are, are heavily reliant on the source and the supply chain of energy throughout the continents. In addition, this illustrates a paradox that uh, your energy bills are, if you follow the supply chain, going to a state-owned, majority state-owned Russian company. And so there, there's a paradox here that uh, that money uh, is, is being used to fuel the, the war in Ukraine. And I've got Antonio on the line, and I just wanted to, to bring in an installation energy manager. Uh, Antonio works at Sigonella for the Navy and was hoping that he could, uh, if you're still there, Antonio, provide a few remarks on the importance of energy security and solutions such as microgrids uh, today for the Navy. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Hi, Antonio, we can hear you. Nice, OK. So uh, first of all, uh, I want to say hello, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. As Doug said, um, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, I had an echo for a second. And I'm the installation energy manager at uh, Naval Air Station Sigonella. And so I'm in charge of the energy saving program. Um, as I already explained, um, energy security, it's uh, one of the um, pillar we work with, and especially after the last executive orders. And so uh, besides the uh, crisis we're living, we're trying to put together projects that move, not only reduce the energy usage and increase the renewable, but move the base to a more reliable um, island and mode. So uh, microgrid are uh, highly encouraged uh, projects. Nevertheless, a microgrid, it's not an easy project. I'm trying to put together a small microgrid project in our solution, and I'm facing so many issues. And the issues that I'm living with are two types of issues mainly. One is technical issues, and they are like electrical issues. Microgrid is not like a package you can just buy and install and pretend it works. Microgrid has to be designed and fit for each single use. So it depends by this, where the substation is, electrical panels rates, uh, what kind of load you have. So you cannot just pretend you buy and install a microgrid. Microgrid has to be somehow designed for the use, the final use you, you intend to have it for. And the second one is that as energy manager, we are always supposed to put together projects that pay back. Without payback, we cannot put projects together. Even if it's the project increase the energy security, the project has to pay back by itself. That means the microgrid has to have components that provide energy savings, not just during outage, but along the year. So somehow you have to build your microgrid, including components like, for example, photovoltaic panels, that provide savings for the whole year, 365 days a year, and the savings has to be big enough to pay back the overall microgrid project. And that's not an easy math there, but that's what I'm working with. And um, to make sure it works, you need to have a good study and a good simulation tools. I'm currently working with MPS on one of these tools to simulate the microgrid to make sure that it works when it's needed to. Uh, that's my input for you guys today. Thanks. Thank you, Antonio. Next slide. Um, hang on, we have a question from yes. Gary Russ. Gary, um, Gary, do you want to come on um, off your mic and ask your question? Yeah, go back to the uh, previous slide, please. So uh, I'm the uh, co-chair of the UCOM uh, climate change uh, working group. And uh, as you can appreciate, we got a lot of targets at us for various uh, uh, taskers and information draws. And I, I guess the things that I have come to conclusion is that this, the Brown University estimate is way off and is using inappropriate data. So I, whether I'm a fact or not, that you'll have to determine that. But I would at least be a little more cautious in saying that quote and making sure that uh, they are correct because I don't think they are. Uh, I've done a couple of uh, taskers with uh, DLA and uh, the Air Force. Also, uh, just since I'm talking, uh, yesterday was a, uh, a meeting for a proposed uh, tri-service European Energy Technical Working Group uh, regarding U.S. installations and uh, for all the different components. We still haven't put it together but we're working in that direction. There's a, uh, I have a contract with a guy out of Erdic uh, that is doing an installational engagement um, with their adjacent uh, service companies that supply energy to the installations. So those are the three things uh, that are working along for me. Over.
Thank you very much for those comments. Very relevant and helpful to have that insight from you. Thank you. Next slide. So here we have the most recent policies throughout the Department of Defense that show the, the framework that they have for energy, achieving energy security uh, and, and aligning both the resilient aspects of this and then also the sustainability uh, goals and requirements that they established. I've bolded here on this graphic each of the, the buzzwords within those policies and what you can see from this is the picture that we're driving toward a, a future that includes carbon free electricity, uh, sustainable energy solutions, resilient energy solutions. So all of the policies are moving us in this direction. What today shows is that uh, we've got to move faster. There's other geopolitical uh, events of today and then also climate. Uh, is, is, is changing rapidly. Uh, there's heat waves throughout the continent that are uh, in turn, uh, you know, thousands of people are dying from the heat. And so we've got to come forward with solutions that can both uh, mitigate and adapt to the threats of today. The Army has a climate strategy. Uh, the first pillar of that is to install a microgrid on every installation by 2035. And I think there's a lot of argument for prioritizing solutions such as that in Europe. Uh, there are other metrics for energy resilience, looking for 14 days of energy autonomy and certain levels of power availability for critical missions. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, each year has some aspect uh, or a goal for energy security, uh, looking at diversification of energy resources, promotion of microgrids, uh, identification of renewable clean energy sources. And there's talks about uh, in this coming 2023 NDAA, uh, there being a requirement for uh, brushing off the installation energy plans and showing, uh, you know, quantifying or validating uh, that metric that the Brown study might not have uh, accurately forecasted or portrayed, uh, but something that the, uh, hopefully the installations are going to get a better grasp, uh, grasp on in the coming year. As well, there's the executive order for 1405, uh, 14057 for carbon free electricity. That's the same order that is transitioning fleet uh, non tactical vehicles uh, to electric uh, by 2027. So they're looking for uh, climate resilient infrastructure and operations in addition to carbon free electricity. Uh, there's numerous regional and state policies, CONUS and OCONUS, that again are moving us in this, in this direction. Next slide. So I think what today calls for and, and most folks would agree to is that we've got to refocus energy security on the unique challenges uh, of today within Europe. We've got to incorporate energy security as a requirement for all projects, and that might be as simple as installing rooftop solar or carports uh, with new facilities uh, or you know, installing heat pumps uh, for electric heating. Uh, you know, looking for energy efficiency measures uh, that can be implemented with all new construction. We should be using all appropriated funding and third party financing authorities at the DOD's disposal to develop these projects. Uh, notably, these projects don't happen overnight. Infrastructure takes years to develop. And so there's already projects in the pipeline for fiscal year 25 and, and forward. Uh, so it, it might be necessary to try to expedite some of those projects and pull them forward. We want to prioritize microgrids that allow and incorporate uh, increased levels of renewable energy and allow sustained uh, islanding or autonomous operability. To the extent possible, apply alternative energy technologies, uh, looking at diversification of fuel, uh, hydrogen over the next decade is likely going to be uh, a, a solution that Europe pursues and invests heavily in. Uh, Black and Beach has been selected the EPC engineer procurement construction contractor, contractor on uh, the world's largest green hydrogen hub in Utah with Mitsubishi and Magnum developments. And so we think at a regional level, there's a lot of opportunity to provide a solution such as hydrogen, add fuel cells at installations, and try to wean ourselves off of uh, gas. Additionally, uh, there's 
uh, historically, uh, Europe has relied heavily on nuclear power, and we think that advanced nuclear technologies also offer uh, an opportunity to reduce reliance on delivered fuel, uh, such as gas, and uh, they also provide a carbon-free source of electricity. Extended duration energy storage will increase uh, penetration of renewables, and that could be flow batteries, uh, mechanical energy storage, kinetic, or other. Uh, and then, as always, promote energy efficiency, uh, inclusive of energy storage that best serves the uh, needs and conditions of the local area. Next slide. We've got a couple applied approaches slides that show uh, those, those metrics for energy autonomy and then power availability. This shows how solutions might evolve as you try to achieve higher levels of energy independence. You need to incorporate uh, a more diverse set of technologies. You need to consider the supply chain. You have to move beyond the traditional uh, backup power solution, which is just a diesel uh, generator at your facility in a, in a day tank. Uh, energy security today requires a much broader view of the, the, the challenge and then the solutions. The, the whole rail is continuous operation for your critical and essential loads. And that could come from a, a source such as nuclear, geothermal, or a lot of wind and solar and batteries. Uh, some hybrid solution likely will provide that. Next slide. This steps you up a ladder and shows a, a, a sample installations breakdown of what their power availability requirements may be. Uh, as you move up the ladder, you achieve higher levels of availability for your most critical missions. Cost increases, redundancy increases, automated switching increases, the complexity of the solutions uh, increase as well. So those requirements at the very top, just 30 seconds of annual downtime is something that uh, you only want to impose that requirement on your most critical missions, such as a radar or missile defense system, uh, given the cost and the complexity to achieve that. Uh, but there are other uh, solutions. Uh, five minutes of downtime is very common for your critical missions. And uh, that can be achieved through a combination of backup generation and response quickly, likely some redundancy and automated switching and energy storage as well. Next slide. We've got a sample project Miramar uh, that Black and Beach did work on. This was in California. Uh, it's, I think that the, the best part of this project for today's crises in Europe is the ability of the Navy and the Marine Corps uh, to have used the microgrid at Miramar during emergency events, during the, the heat waves and the wildfires uh, in Southern California, Miramar was turned on. There was a request from SDG&E, uh, and then Miramar turned on their six megawatts of generation, and in turn uh, prevented the, uh, the rolling brownout of, of thousands of homes in the area. So not just uh, providing critical power for the, the military, but this microgrid is also serving the community and providing stability for, for all of the community that surrounds uh, this uh, installation. Next slide. It incorporates numerous technologies. We've got thin uh, film PV roof, uh, rooftop systems. And I guess before I go much further, this was a joint venture with Schneider Electric. They provided the controls uh, in a lot of the microgrid integration here. And then Black and Beach provided the power plant and the design. So we've got landfill gas uh, that uh, has varying levels of reliability, but when it is online and, and functioning, uh, that does provide a firm source of power for the microgrid. Carports as well uh, have, have been installed. There's current, uh, currently a battery energy storage system that's underway. And then finally, two sources of energy, uh, ge backup generation. We've got natural gas generation and then also diesel generation. Next slide. The quote from uh, Colonel Dockery, I think, says it all. Our microgrid delivers capabilities that will make Miramar one of the most energy forward defense installations in the nation uh, and, and likely in the world. Uh, and so we, through our execution of this project, capture numerous lessons learned that we apply to all of our the, the microgrids that our team has developed uh, throughout the world. Most recently, we, we had worked on a, a microgrid, a couple in Europe, 
Uh, one at, at Suda Bay, we're working on the development of the microgrid there. Uh, and then also at Zutendal in Belgium, looking at installing solar uh, PV and battery energy storage microgrid for that installation. The great thing about solar is there is sun uh, everywhere. Uh, the challenge is that there's very level, varying levels of irradiance and with different sun and weather patterns in Belgium and Greece. That's a prime example of you get a, a lot higher output in Greece for your solar uh, investment than you do in Belgium. Yes. Hey, um, <clears throat> Doug, Tim has a question, wants to know if you are able to speak to the uh, ability to be payback requirements for microgrid. Sure, sure. Well, that's a, a great question. And microgrids, by definition, integrate numerous technologies. And as Antonio had stated at the very beginning, uh, one of the, the key uh, benefits of these is that you can use technologies such as solar uh, or natural gas peaking plants in, in the US uh, or batteries on a daily basis uh, to provide an economic dispatch. And a lot of that economic dispatch is based on the uh, utility tariff parameters. If there's a demand charge uh, or a varying uh, rate, that changes based on the, the time of day or seasonally, uh, you can start using your batteries to, to both peak shave and then also perform uh, arbitrage, which is charging during off peak hours and discharging during the most expensive hours of the day, uh, usually from one to four or so uh, in the afternoon. As well, in the States, it's often uh, common to use natural gas uh, generators for peak shaving. And that's uh, dispatched based on what's called the spark spread or the marginal uh, benefits, the comparison of the marginal cost of purchasing electricity from the utility versus the marginal cost of producing that power with your behind the meter energy sources. And so with all of that, a lot of it's driven based on the utility tariff and the regulations that are in place in a specific location. Uh, but the more you can stack use cases, uh, the more likely it is that a large portion of your uh, energy projects can can be uh, can can pay itself back. And one of I think the best development strategies that the Department of Defense can use is trying to use third party financing uh, such as an ESPC uh, or UESC or EUL uh, use third party financing to the extent possible to recapitalize the major sources of energy such as solar and batteries. And then you could come in with a with an appropriated funding project such as URSIP, stack those acquisition authorities and pay for a microgrid controller, the power distribution upgrades, and the switching throughout the system to make it all integrate and work together. So that as much as possible, leverage your third party financing solutions up until your major assets are, are uh, the return on investment uh, you know, pencils out, and then you're going to have to likely apply uh, some some level of appropriated funding to make that all work. Next slide. Right, and then one more after this. Here we've got different uh, programmatic lessons learned at each stage of project developments, all the way from the conception of a requirement at a, a very programmatic level aligning the project requirements to the policies, uh, defining uh, the priorities of a project, whether that's sustainability, resilience, or efficiency, uh, or reliability, uh, or cybersecurity. You've got to define those main goals of each project. And then at each stage, uh, you know, from planning and development all the way through operation, we've got some lessons learned. I don't know that I've got to read them all off, but they're here for reference. Uh, and, and they will be up online as well for the future reference. It was about a four second delay and we're hearing very faint. So if it takes a while for us to laugh at your joke, apologies. Next slide. Here, this is the programmatic execution uh, that our team has developed in partnership with our with our clients. I think that what was shown here is that, as Antonio said, 
there's a lot of effort at the very front end of these projects to validate feasibility, optimize the, the approach that you're using to procure a microgrid, right? Antonio said it's not just an off the shelf technology that you can purchase and install. There's a lot of front end effort to find the best solution and shape that uh, based on the parameters and the constraints that you have. So we've got some of those at a planning development level stage, engineering studies, uh, charrette concept designs all the way through operations and maintenance. Uh, th this approach is, is kind of like a menu of, of choices for your clients. Uh, they don't have to do all of these things, but the more they do, uh, likely the better execution is gonna be. Um, often I think, there's this concept that smaller microgrids might be easier to execute. Uh, that can that can be the opposite uh, when it comes to these projects. If you've oversized the system, there's less optimization that's required. Uh, you're you're going to spend more capital cost on the equipment, uh, but the design and integration is likely not going to be as challenging uh, if you've got a microgrid that just turns on and powers your whole base. But if you've got a microgrid that has to start prioritizing different loads uh, within your facility and integrating with your power distribution, there's a lot of analysis and potentially renovation of existing infrastructure that's required. And so th that's where these analyses really uh, show their value uh, when it comes to optimizing the solutions. Next slide. That's it. So we've got time for a Q&A. If folks are in the room have questions or online. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Can, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, the small nuclear package microgrids? Sure. Are those a, sure. be a thing? Sure. And if if folks online or in the room uh, know more about small modular reactors, please jump in and provide that insight. Um, <laughs> but I will I will share what I do know which is that there are two types of advanced nuclear technologies. Uh, there are small modular reactors that are in the 50 megawatt to 100 megawatt range, which is a bit larger than most of your installations are going to require. Fort Benning, for example, has a 70 megawatt peak load. So a small modular reactor might work at a really large base. Um, most likely, if and when the DOD moves or the energy industry moves in that direction, I don't know that these are assets that the DOD is going to want to own and operate, though they may. There's experience, obviously, with naval reactors uh, in owning and operating um, small uh, reactors, I don't know how modular, but on different ships, right, on submarines. They've been using this since the Admiral Rickover days. The micro reactors, I think, are going to be more applicable to the Department of Defense. Those are going to be in the 5 to 10 megawatt range uh, and likely going to be something that you just drop for you don't forget about it, but uh, you don't have to do much to it uh, for 10 years, 15 years, however long it takes for that fuel to, to be spent and run out. Uh, likely we'll see solutions such as bury it in the ground, pour concrete over it, uh, you know, plug into it, and in, in 10, 15 years, uh, hopefully unbury it, or uh, I wouldn't leave it at that point. <laughs> but the DOD uh, is demonstrating a, a pilot project, I think, in Alaska. Uh, if, if folks are familiar with that, Ielson Air Force. Ielson Air Force. That's that's the right one. Yes. And so I, I think it's going to be, uh, hopefully, if it goes on schedule, which is very rare with nuclear projects. But if it does, I think the target's 2026. Is that? I think I read 27. But it's okay. 26 to 27. So once that first one is demonstrated successfully. Uh, likely that could open the, the way to, to many more of these. And given the challenge that we're facing, both in the demand for carbon free electricity and then also for energy independence, I think we're going to need solutions uh, such as nuclear advancements uh, to provide what, what the, the industry and what the DoD is calling for. Um, Gary had a comment on that. Gary, do you want to come off uh, mute and No, I, I, I guess basically uh, our theater is looking for those uh, uh, nuclear uh, deployable act, uh, capabilities, and uh, I've been unsuccessful at getting anybody to try and test it out here, so I, I guess I just throw that out on the table. Over.
Thank you very much for that insight. I do know Black and Beach is working on some of the, the larger uh, end of the small modular reactors. I'm sure there's other companies that are, are working on those earlier stage development projects as well. I think that the General Electric project that were the owner's engineer is in the States. Um, but countries such as France have tremendous background and history and experience with nuclear. And maybe the politics is uh, for that reason a little bit easier in Europe to navigate. So I would I would definitely agree with uh, your continuing to pursue that uh, type of solution for Europe. Yeah, I, I guess I'm looking at it as a more of a field operations. We have obviously uh, some NATO uh, support locations that could use it uh, as a test case uh, that are field operations. And then, of course, we have uh, other elements in Poland that uh, uh, we still have temporary housing and you know tents and all that kind of stuff over. That's great insight. Thank you very much. We had a question in the room. Yeah. So perhaps customers don't necessarily know like the left and right limits of what you're asking for in one of your pictures that came up uh, in the parking lot with the, the solar panel like has potentially multiple locations each day, uh, shading for the heat issues. Maybe that's something the customer wanted. So I, I guess my question would be if is there any sort of automatic analysis that anyone does? Like, say, someone says they want to, you know, cover uh, parking lot, with covered parking, and you know, you come back and say, oh, by the way, you know, five five percent, you know, these can be solar panels, charge your vehicles, and plus, uh, you know, what I mean, like that, that customer may not know they have their storage. All of them. I mean, yeah. People online couldn't hear you. Yeah, I can. I can, can repeat. Yeah. Summarize. That's okay. Repeat that. Sure. Perfect. Thanks. And your name? Hi, uh, Mike Scar. Okay. Major Mike Scar asked the question about how to communicate, and I'm going to paraphrase here, hopefully not uh, ruin this, but how to communicate all of the different ancillary benefits of something such as uh, carports to your customers. And that could be uh, not overheating your cars uh, or the, the pavement itself. Obviously, the pavement's a heat sink. And so this any shading or ancillary benefits that uh, something like carports can provide uh, your customers should be part of the message that you communicate to support the development of those projects. Is that paraphrase correct? No, I haven't answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I guess what I was getting at is like saying if you um, want to come closer to the speaker, you can. You can come on camera. I, I was just thinking if uh, if it was assigned like a, a task order, right? That uh, if if there was any analysis on uh, covered parking lots for sure, pay, sure. Of pay for you know ten percent more. This could also be a microgrid project, as opposed to you have a task order to provide parking with cover. Right. I mean, this is a this is pretty low hanging fruit. Maybe they very yes. down, but, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, it's just something that kind of came to mind. Thank you. Yes, I haven't seen a simple rule of thumb for that uh, analysis, but what we do is typically, and we've done this on the, the recent projects, look for where is their car, where is their parking, uh, and then we map out in a software called Aurora, and there are many different softwares that do this, but we map out uh, the panels, uh, how many you can fit over the parking spots, look at where the shading is occurring, uh, and then from that, extract what you think your output could be. Uh, and so it, it really is going to be based on the, the shading uh, for the payback. Um, but I, I do think this is low hanging fruit and uh, would encourage anywhere where there are, uh, you know, open parking spots in locations that have high levels of irradiance. I think this is going to pay out, especially with the new baseline prices within Europe that we're seeing. The other thing I'll say is that I think that opens up a great point about solar in that you should look for solutions that uh, don't commandeer uh, or steal real estate. You want to try to provide solutions that integrate with uh, real estate, which is often one of the, the more challenging aspects of developing a solar project. Carports are a great example because you get to keep your car spot, uh, parking spot, 
uh, rooftop solar as well. You got to keep your facility. Uh, there are uh, different uh, solutions for ground mounts solar for integrating with the real estate around there. Uh, I think, which I don't know how much of this applies for the DoD, but there might be uh, installations where it does things like agri agrivoltaics. Uh, if if you have property that uh, somebody could grow a vineyard underneath uh, the wine, there's been studies that show that there's the shading for the the vines is actually very good and it cools the soil down and it cools the whole area and you get a higher output of soil so you're able to again stack use cases for the lands there's also uh grazing under the the grass and you can bring a, a herd of sheep in uh maybe in a, in a rural european village and uh you don't have to mow them and, and the community might not be as upset about uh using this land for another purpose yes uh, so one of the issues we have at the topic um, at many forward installations in you know, uh, energy and, and uh, basically I'm trying to ask like, how how would we go about proposing these at, at different projects like right at different sites so so the NDAA you know really encourages you know what grids but if I were to come to my boss uh, and, and say like hey we want to put a little uh, nuclear power plant here or you know, all of the, the money that would cost you know, to, to install, to, I'm thinking of a, a base presumably that we're just using using fuel to, to power everything. That's the like, you want to get away from that, but it kind of starts from nothing and then just really grew so we're kind of getting out of control. But to, to be able to revamp this would cost millions and billions and billions of dollars. I don't know how how uh, who, who's pushing this from the top because I can't. I can't propose it to my boss and tell me, you know, crazy like you have no, and you have the budget. You might need to repeat that or Brian, yeah, you, you need to come over here. <laughs> sure, sure. That's a, a great question. And it, it it's regarding uh, both budget constraints and personnel constraints at, uh, throughout the, the DOD and in Europe and at these installations. How at an installation level do you initiate a project such as this, knowing that you have a challenge, you have a problem, but you might not have uh, the, the uh, support from leadership. Uh, maybe you have verbal support, but not the, the financial support. Yeah, so that's the question. Um, I don't know that there's an easy answer with this, uh, but I would start with pointing to the policies and the authorities in state. You know, we've got in the National Defense Authorization Act a goal to uh, brush off our installation energy plans and start at the study level and show one, what's our reliance on uh, Russian energy? Uh, what's our cost of electricity? How's that increasing? And I, I think also communicating that the, there's a bigger expense with the status quo uh, and showing that with a little bit of investment, starting with that planning, uh, you, you're going to uh, reap returns. The, the challenge is the DOD doesn't always make uh, business case decisions with funding year after year and a return on investment that takes years. Um, but again, starting with the, the planning uh, and development level, uh, I, there's a few different offices that we've worked with uh, and that we know are, are going to be leading this effort. Uh, Incom, uh, you know, working with the installation energy managers, I think is is a great first step. Uh, as well, the Office of Energy Initiatives for the Army uh, is going to I don't know that how much support they'll provide in Europe, uh, but at a, at a global level and in continental United States, they do provide support in developing these projects. And then if you've got any sorts of um, contract vehicles to get to an AE firm, there, there's Black and Beach and others uh, like us that can help in shaping the initial uh, studies and solutions and trying to help communicate the importance of this uh, to leadership. Um. Claude Armstrong from USAG Rhineland Falls asks a question. Has there been any studies showing the relationship to solar panels on flat roofs, the roof cooling effect, the delta T, and reduction in interior heat gain on upper floors, personal comfort, HVAC, energy savings? That is an interesting question, and I have not seen that done uh, personally. Has anybody in the room? Seen that analysis? No. It, it certainly could be done. I would anticipate that uh, 
it, it would only benefit uh, the 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 whole facility. Uh, in uh, I don't I don't think it would increase heating. I, you know they're they're reflective uh, to the point that uh, you have to worry about the reflection uh, and the angle of reflection when it comes to uh, nearby air air traffic, and so I I, I can't. Uh, anticipate that it would do much to heat the buildings, uh, but perhaps it, they can. Yeah. You, you would save energy. So when, yes, when you when you do an HVAC load calculation, you model the roof. So this is really just kind of a logical extension of that. So you can pick the model. It would affect the overall size of the HVAC system in your building. So you could put a smaller system in. The system that you did have would be running at less load. Yes, but then you could also also look at the cost savings as a delta that would potentially offset the cost of the solar panels as a life cycle cost analysis to help justify. Definitely. Yeah, it, it could certainly be done. I have not seen it, but I, that's a, a perfect way to tackle that, that question. Question in the room? Yes, we're working with uh, or, or have hit a milestone where they're they're developing a microgrid project uh, for the Ursip program, Energy Resilience Conservation Investment Program. They rely on one. Uh, Cedar Bay um, has historically had a lot of power outages. There's they're at the end of in uh, a fairly unreliable grid currently in Crete. The local utility. Uh, Hedno is making investments. They're connecting the transmission system to the mainland uh, through the Peloponnese. Uh, but they're, the installation is at the same time that Hedno's making investments in their infrastructure. They're trying to move away from just uh, diesel generation. And there also is existing solar PV at Suda Bay. So the, the microgrid project that if it gets approved by OSD to move forward would add solar, uh, add a microgrid controller, and uh, minimize the reliance on uh, the diesel generation. And very likely there would be a battery energy storage associated with that. Uh, Suda Bay uh, has goals as well to decarbonize their installation and be more resilient. And so they're, I think, going to be at the front end of uh, a, a European innovative solution uh, for a bike and Do you have any urgent on any of the hydro projects in Europe? Yes, Zubzendal was another one that was solar and battery that uh, we just finished the concept design for. Again, that's at a decision gate. OSD has to give it money to move forward into detailed design and then also uh, uh, construction. That was solar and battery. Uh, the, the, the Belgian weather isn't as beneficial. As, as Greek weather uh, for solar, we saw in our weather profiles, there's a couple weeks a year where you're barely getting any output from the solar, but still uh, for, you know, to throw a cliche at it, you know, every kilowatt hour matters. And so whatever any of these installations can do uh, to add solar is going to be beneficial. Uh, there's likely other folks on the phone and in the room that know about other microgrids in Europe that are either constructed or under development. I think some might stretch the different definition of a microgrid, uh, and as well, I anticipate that some of these are at a very early concept level. Any other questions, comments, experiences? Yeah, we'd love to hear more. Uh, experiences if folks have them on the phone, uh, either specifically to an installation or a regional level, or trying to navigate these policies, uh, you know, such as the NDAA policy or executive order. You know, how do you, how can we navigate those in a European environment? I've got lots of questions if folks have answers. <laughs> package, say like the range control tower or or some project that you know we're, we're not we're not looking to implement these kinds of projects. But there is the creative ways to say hey, there's an efficiency that we can just at our level to 
to implement my implementation project that in a way that makes sense. And this new and project, I know that's a complicated sure, sure, question sure. and answer. And, and, you know, it's, it's kind yes. of chicken and egg between the Texas and the other receiving company. Yes, yes. I think that's a great question. Uh, with, with smaller satellite uh, facilities uh, or projects that might not be as large as the Miramar, how can you still try to implement these same types of solutions? Is this the question? And um, I don't know that there's a there's a simple answer, uh, but the payback, you know, it's it's hard to argue with finances and numbers. If, if you can, you know, pencil out what the investment cost might be, what the return is. Uh, there, there might also be ways to package. Uh, again, this is not an easy thing to do, but I, I know that there have been ESPCs that uh, package projects or energy conservation measure, measures at multiple different bases. And so you, you could try to develop an ESPC project that uh, provides ECMs throughout the region. And you bundle those all together and you get the economies of scale for uh, an ESCO to make it easier for them to finance. Uh, but from a development standpoint, I, I do think you you would likely want support um, from from either uh, you know an in-house SME, you know, coming from Huntsville or or some, you know, somebody that does this type of work uh, in Europe. I find find somebody in the army that does it or work with one of your contractors to try to initiate a very high level concept that you can then start, you know, taking on a road trip and trying to get buy and support forward. There are solutions that are, I think, more rapidly deployable, modular, uh, in packages uh, that might be applicable for small satellite installations that you don't know how long you're going to be there, for example. If it's a mobile solution, you could have uh, like a, a a containerized battery energy storage uh, inverter plug for a backup generator and solar that flips out. I've seen uh, multiple different companies that offer that. So that does kind of turn into something. Um, it's 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 customized, so it's not really off the shelf, but it's something that takes a little bit less planning to development and design work. It's something that you can purchase. Uh, I think even through GSA um, vehicles and provide for more remote locations. Yeah. I, I think from in the European theater, the, the technical and the financial things are always challenges, but I think one of the bigger challenges for us here has been the, the regulatory mm -hmm. environment and every country has a different you know, regulate, regulatory environment for their particular service providers that has been a struggle, at least about the Air Force side here. And ESA comes in as a prime example, and we had a proposal, some very valid um, co-generation options that were um, not able to be executed because the, the energy companies in, here in Germany wasn't going to be off. We couldn't get through the regulatory hurdles to do that. So just a, another kind of twist that makes it more a little bit more difficult here in Europe, perhaps, than than it is home. That's a that's a great great insight and something that we we've experienced and and heard about from from our clients. Again, I don't know that there's a simple answer. But maybe the, the tides are changing. There's more political need for uh, energy efficiency solutions. And so the fact that <clears throat> a utility might be losing a little bit of revenue, uh, they, they might not be as concerned with that revenue loss, which is often, in, even in the United States, when you start taking away uh, power demand from the utility, uh, they're, they're losing revenue. So that's, you know, especially today, and we heard even yesterday from a client, we don't want our utility companies to fail. There are agreements in locations like Guam, where the DOD makes up such a large portion of the utilities revenue. They have um, a one Guam memorandum of understanding uh, where all of the infrastructure projects have to be mutually beneficial uh, for both the DOD customer and the utility. And so I, I think we're either formally or informally uh, going to have to navigate those mutually beneficial projects and 
hopefully the regulations evolve with that. Okay, we have five minutes left and we have two more questions Great. from our online audience. Um, I'll start first. Uh, question from Salvatore Corcione. I hope I pronounced it close. Uh, it says, if you were forced to build a microgrid piecemeal or in a phased approach due to funding or annual budget limitations, where might be the best place to start? Installing renewable energy generation assets, upgrading transformers and electrical infrastructure, mm. installing a control system? I love this question. <laughs> this is my favorite question so far. Uh, it's very technical and something that uh, with all of our projects we experience uh, having to navigate what is the existing capability of the infrastructure with what are the needs of the microgrid. Uh, we typically don't get a choose how uh, the, the solutions are stacked or executed uh, or the, the order in which they are. Uh, but if if I had a, and, and we, uh, and I'm sure many technical folks had a, a, so a suggestion here, first, upgrade your power distribution system, make sure that uh, at a location like Zutendal, for example, that I've, I haven't personally seen power distribution system that old. Uh, you know, it was from the, the 50s. I, I cannot believe it was it's still being operated. Very unsafe. Uh, I, I won't say all of what I saw there, but I will say that uh, there are needs to uh, there. Are, there are urgent safety uh, needs to upgrade that system. And so I would start with power distribution and with that, make sure that you're considering what the needs of the future microgrid are. So when it comes especially to switching, uh, that's I think, and then the communications backbone that you're installing, that's the, the biggest first need that get it right the first time, if you can. Uh, we were working a project at Camp Laws uh, in Guam for the Marine Corps. That was a new construction. It was the first new Marine Corps installation in 50 some years. And you would have thought they could get it right, uh, but they they didn't have that end vision for what the the final energy secure solution would look like. And during the the planning or detailed design of their power distribution system, which was a separate project from their microgrid, they value engineered out the automated switching of their distribution system. And that was something that could not be field retrofitted after they value engineered that out. And we had to come in after the fact and say, no, no, we need that for the microgrid. And that cost an extra $9 million as those switches were coming out brand new out of the factory for the DOD to have to say, well, actually, we're going to have to toss those switches and procure new ones uh, because we can't uh, close in uh, the, the critical loads when we need them uh, powered. So power distribution is a big one. And I would start there. And then I would, in the in my economic mind, uh, go after renewables after that, and and try to size renewables to the extent possible in incorporating as much rooftop and carport solar and ground mounted solar that you can, up to the the power demand uh, constraints or, case, or de demands of the uh, installation. See if you can add battery energy storage and then try to see to what extent you can shape your energy profile around those renewable sources. And then finally, you've now optimized how much backup generation you actually need uh, for the microgrid. And so if you use your batteries and solar to peak shave in island mode, very likely you've lowered the demands on your generators uh, by, by an order of magnitude uh, based on the incorporation of solar. Uh, we've seen other strategies uh, Djibouti is a great example of they produce all of their electricity using prime power diesel generators uh, behind the meter. It's very expensive. Uh, if they were to add solar now, uh, they likely don't have as much demand on their diesel generators, uh, but they're not going to start throwing those away. Uh, so it's, it's not an optimized system, but maybe still uh, they would get economic environmental benefits and more. OK, last question. Um, short answer uh, from Robin Witter. The, he asks, uh, do you see um, real micro micro grids like the little balcony power plant size as an opportunity for small facilities as well? 
How would you rate the investment return ratio? And is the trend more for full automatic microgrid or micro and smart grid uh, do risk of IT infrastructure and um, cause risk uh, risks to be impacted? Short answer. Great question. <laughs> I have 30 more minutes to fully answer that. Um, Sorry for the. For the I, I'm, we, I'm, I'm willing to it's, stay if y'all well, want to stay, it. but okay. okay. <laughs> My voice is going to be monotonous. So apologies, <laughs> people are dozing off after lunch. Um, I, I do think the smaller solutions are still valid, and that might turn into something more of an off the shelf product that you can procure. Uh, rooftop solar for homes uh, has payback um, all over the, the US, and I, I think even California, or is it Hawaii? I don't know if anybody can correct me here. Uh, is is showing a requirement for all new construction of homes uh, to include rooftop solar. So even at a, at a home level, I don't know about a balcony level, but at a home level, uh, the, the economics are still there and the benefits are still there. When it comes to cybersecurity, that is absolutely critical for all of the projects. It's something that's rapidly changed over the last five years, the requirements, uh, the threat itself. Uh, it, you know, something we've worked through uh, often. Another element of that challenge might be that the power distribution is privatized. So we have a, a few different microgrids that are on privatized distribution systems that are supporting mission critical assets. And so again, how do you handle the cybersecurity for that? Uh, that's another question. Sorry, not an, an answer. Um, and then finally, with operability and maintainability and automation, uh, typically, as engineers, uh, we want to put as much automation on the system as possible to help with response time and optimization. Uh, but more often than not, uh, the utility operators at these bases uh, do everything manually and have a way of knowing uh, what is safe and what isn't. And they're more comfortable with continuing to operate manually. We don't want to put systems on, on installation uh, utility operators that are owners to, to operate and maintain. And so we have to be very cognizant as we develop these projects to work with the operators and make sure that uh, while the, the energy security benefits are being realized, that the solutions can be sustained that we put in. I'll end there. Okay, um, Brad Jennings um, commented on uh, Mr. Corcione's question. He says he would also aggressively get after demand reduction in order not uh, to not oversize the panel by that's good. first step first before step. power distribution maybe with it in parallel but yeah that is energy efficiency is is always is always the first all right great. that's hey, great thanks Sharice. thanks Doug for taking the time to come here and sharing your expertise with the group if you don't mind coming up here on behalf of Scott our chapter president I wanted to Present you with uh, one of our post coins. Thank you very much. So thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate it. And folks on the chart, you've got Doug and Sharice's email addresses. I'm yeah. sure that uh, they'd be happy to take any other questions on those channels. Do a do over. Oh, picture. <laughs> Not in the blue light, unless you like that look. Unless you like the blue it's just light. A little bit that way. So, and I thank you and safe travels uh, to be returning home.